Okay, we are on and people are starting to join in. Good. I'm so glad you guys make it here. Yeah. We have Frick and Bino here today and I'm more than excited, let me tell you guys. I can't even describe the kind of work he's doing because he's one of those pioneers and he's still pushing the limit. So I'm gonna have him take over to do an introduction, let you guys know about him. And after that, we'll be playing a demo and he will let us know more about his demo. So Fred, take it away. Okay, well, thank you for coming. I'm glad to see that some people have um, turned up. <laughs> um, so I, you'll have to bear with me because I've never done anything like this before. So um, if it doesn't run as smoothly as it should do, then I apologize. So I spent a while trying to think of what to do for this year's Vision X. Uh, and the idea for this demo came from from a comment that Brian Mark Taylor made actually last year, where he suggested that 3D might be um, a useful resource for creating reference for an oil painting. So I thought that might be uh, something to cover. I mean, three digital uh, has come a long way in 20 years from being really difficult and unintuitive to being fast and intuitive. So. Um, we can work in um, many different ways these days. I thought it'd be interesting to combine those working methods. Um, it's not a definitive way of doing anything. It's just uh, a fun way of exploring three different uh, ways of, uh, of working, and it might give you some ideas along the way. We need a design, and I'd start off doing that in Photoshop. Um, I thought I'd, for this demo, I'd do a spaceship docking, which is an idea that I've done many times before. So it was a nice, simple idea for, for this demonstration. Um, I haven't got a brief for this, so I'm just making it up as I go along. And generally, if you look on the right hand side, you see the different layers in Photoshop there. I'll just start drawing shapes. Although I did this spiky wheel thing um, as a biro drawing, and that kind of inspired me, uh, uh, gave me a starting point, basically. So um, I've got a second layer at the top there, and I'm uh, just extending the canvas to make it more cinematic, which is uh, one advantage of doing this in Photoshop as opposed to doing it traditionally. And then you've got tools like the Transform tool, which are, are always fun to use, so you can move stuff about. So um, yes, just basically um, drawing shapes at this point uh, to try and come up with a design, um, and say using the Transform tool. Uh, the rotate tools uh, are a really nice uh, tool in Photoshop. Um, before, I think it was the first iteration was CS6, where you could actually rotate the canvas. Um, before that, the Cintiq that I had, uh, you would actually rotate the entire screen. Um, but that's something not practical with the Cintiq I've got today. It's, um, it's about the size and weight of a small car. So being able to do it in um, Photoshop is uh, a lot easier. So I, I usually, not always, but in this case, I'm starting off uh, with line uh, and just filling in some of the uh, the dark areas to try and come up with um, an idea of the volume and the shape of it. Um, again, using the transform tool, using the eraser tool there to take out uh, highlights. Um, generally, just letting the design um, find its own way, really. So I had the idea that this would be a ship docking into a, a port and the front end of it would be in shadow. Um, and the back end would be lit, so that would give kind of an interesting um, lighting scenario. So just using the transform tool there to uh, move these shapes around to try and get them. I was trying to give it a more aggressive kind of a feel, an aggressive kind of hump. So I'm starting to draw the background in. The background goes through a number of different iterations, um, and I had two ideas of how the background should be, a simple graphic shape or a more complex perspective one. So I went off with the perspective idea. I often use this grid, which I picked up somewhere along the way. Uh, it's just a useful grid for rule of thirds and for helping to line stuff up. Um, I stick that as a, a layer at the top um, and lock it so I don't accidentally paint on it. And then I can use it to help me move stuff around. I'm just moving the ship there um, so that it's lining up to the uh, thirds. Um, a bit better. This is something else I sometimes do in Photoshop, which is um, a perspective uh, vanishing point grid. So um, I drop that over the top, do the same thing, uh, stretch it so the vanishing point is where I want it to be, which is the point of interest of the picture, which is um, the spiky part of the spaceship. 
Um, so I dropped it there to begin with. You'll see as I go along that I change my mind along the way, which is um, a, another nice thing about working digitally is you can do that. So now I'm erasing that background and drawing it again so that it um, follows the perspective of the grid. And now I've just changed my mind again. I thought the vanishing point maybe ought to point right at where I want the viewer to look. So I've moved it up there. So just um, trying to figure out what the background should be. So drawing in some dynamic angles and lines. Uh, and this is the, the landing platform and that I thought that the ship would kind of move into and dock into. You'll see occasionally um, a big batch of Photoshop brushes appear when I decide to uh, move the, um, um, choose a different brush. Um, I don't know how many there are, there must be hundreds in there, but I only really use two brushes uh, and that's um, a chalk brush, slightly modified chalk brush and a round brush, so the only two brushes that I really use. So I put a little skiff type spaceship in there because um, I thought it would balance uh, the platform on the right. So at this point I, did, I need to add some tone to, um, to work out um, how tonely it will be. So I do that by creating a multiply layer and putting it over the top of the whole thing. That allows the line drawing to show through. Um, so I can just start filling in the tone and start off at the horizon, making it because that would be the lightest point, and then slowly um, fill in these darker tones in the foreground. I always tend to light things in the same way, which is something else I changed my mind about further along down the way. But um, the idea initially for this was to light it so it was a dark shape against a bright sky. So the light would be coming from the top right, catching the light, catching the top of the ship, maybe catching the side of that peculiar structure on the side of it. I'm not quite sure what that is. Maybe some kind of anti-gravity device or some kind of um, drive. Um, so just filling in that shape down there. So at this, no, I'm just making the sky a little bit darker. Adding some final details to it. So at this point, I've created another layer and I've kept this one opaque, just uh, a normal layer. So I can paint the highlights in and this time the black lines will disappear uh, underneath the paint. Um, as you can see, I'm taking that highlight at the top. So it's starting to become more realistic and less of a, a filled in line drawing. Uh, but at this stage, when I'm doing these roughs, it's quite nice to leave some of that original line drawing in because it gives it a kind of energy. Um, so it's just a question of deciding what to leave in and what to take out. I'm going to start painting. Um, it's just uh, interesting being able to whiz the uh, illustration around in that way. I've got a friend actually who built a, a rig so he could paint traditionally that way, put his illustration board. Uh, on this thing and turn it around like a turntable so you could get to different parts of it. Uh, and I do that when I'm painting traditionally anyway with oil paints, turn it upside down. Um, it's really helpful to be able to turn the picture in such a way that the sweep of your hand, um, you're not fighting against uh, where your hand wants to move. In other words, you can move it smoothly. So I'm still kind of exploring uh, what this background should be like, what the city should be like. and not really quite happy with it at the moment. So I'm painting the black lines out um, in, in the background on the, the distant kind of buildings, which are supposed to be hazy structures in the mist. By taking the black lines out, it helps those to recede um, and leaving the ones in the foreground. This is speeded up, of course, now, the moments where it's kind of real time. It probably took me about four or five hours to paint this from beginning to end. And this would be um, a rough that I might present to an art director or a production designer um, as an idea of, you know, is this the kind of thing you want? Are these the shapes, kind of shapes that you want? Um, and do you want me to go on from that point? 
So then I've got all those layers on the left hand side uh, and I don't like to work in too many layers because it starts to get confusing and you lose the painterly spontaneous spontaneous kind of quality that you can get that you get when you're painting on a traditional piece of board. So I've flattened all those layers now that I've worked out the, the tones, uh, but I still want some layers because I want to be able to work on the background or work on the ships separately without having to paint around them all the time. So using the lasso tool, um, I've drawn around that ship. Um, I've duplicated that layer and reversed the selection and then deleted the background. So now I've got the ship floating above um, the background. You can see the, uh, the ship is still there on the on the background, but I've now got it on a, a separate layer. Um, and I want to do that with the foreground and with the, uh, the small ship that's floating in the foreground there. So um, I've drawn that again just uh, copy paste worked in this case sometimes with photoshop you um, i do that and it doesn't it moves the image for some reason or you know the spaceship when i tried to do that was in the wrong place so the only way i could do it at that point was to duplicate the layer and reverse the selection so now i'm very quickly um working on the background the uh, the spaceship and the foreground are on other layers that are switched off at the moment but um, i'm just doing a a quick paint over of this to get rid of the, the background. This might seem like a long-winded way of doing it, but it's um, fairly quick. And once you've done it, then it's easy to get to the different layers with, um, and just change them as you, you want to do using various tools in Photoshop. So completely turning that around. It sometimes helps to do that anyway, because it gives you a new perspective on the illustration. Um, and uh, you can spot errors in perspective or whatever. So that's the, I forgot to cut out that little ship. So I'm going to cut that out, copy and paste it. Um, so that's in its own layer now as well. And I'll just uh, paint that out very quickly and then do a few final touches to that, to the background there. Okay, so that's the background with all the elements removed. If I switch those layers back on, you can see I've still got them there on, on separate layers. So what we need to do now is, oh no, sorry, the next trick, the next thing to do is create an alpha channel from each of those separate layers. So by command clicking on the layers, you can see that the alpha channels appearing in the bottom there, and you'll see why I'm doing that uh, shortly. So now I need to add some color. So I know that I want it to be deserty and blue and uh, oranges. So this is a picture of me in the Canyonlands um, in the States uh, taken some years ago. So I'll drop that over the top of all the layers and kind of stretch it. So I've got the color where I want it to be. The oranges are obviously down at the bottom and the blues are at the top. And then I make that layer a color layer. Um, so it drops that color over the top and I just up the saturation a little bit because it does tend to deaden the colors when you put it over a gray background layer like that. So now I can sample the colors, um, the blues and the oranges and put them where I want. Um, if I sample orange, then obviously, um, and paint it over the, the spaceship. I'll, it's a good, a quick way of doing it because it, because you're working from a photograph, which is as a certain kind of uh, homogeneity, if you like, um, it helps to make the whole thing uh, cohesive. Um, and it's just easy to, uh, um, to make those colors work. And so obviously the foreground areas should be more blue where it's in shadow. And the top part of the ship is catching the blue light from the sky. And I've done the same thing again in that I've created um, an opaque layer over the top of all that to paint in highlights. So now I've flattened the whole thing again because I don't want to get too many layers, but I've got these alpha channels already selected. So I can just click on them, make the selection, cut and paste. Um, and those layers, uh, so now I've got uh, all those layers separate again. And if I switch those off in a bit, you'll see I did the same thing with the background and then I painted out the, the ship so that that's what the background looks like. So now I can access those different areas using the levels tools, for example, so I can make that bit darker if I want it to be. Um, using the gradient tool there, 
to just lighten the background um, behind the ship um, and then using the levels tool in the foreground to make those areas darker just kind of uh, working around I've created um, another layer over the ship and I can use the selection that I've made to make sure that I'm not painting over the lines I was always taught never to paint over the lines in coloring books as a child so I think that stayed with me um, you can select like using the marquee tool there just to cut chunks out of the ship um, and the background obviously shows through because I've removed the ship from it so that's uh, another advantage in, in working this way once you've got it set up you can play around with it as much as you want and keep fiddling with it basically so uh, I need to put some figures in uh, they don't have to be brilliant it's just a suggestion of where the figures would go um, it's easier to draw them a bit, bit bigger than I need them to be um, just a suggestion of a guy maybe guiding that whatever it is being lowered onto the front of the ship and then a couple of other characters maybe having a chat on the platform or just looking at the view um, so I'll draw them a little bit bigger and then I can just reduce them down so they're so small at this point that it doesn't really matter well, I've decided to refine that figure on the right a little bit and then drop that down as you can see a lot of the uh, the black lines are still there it kind of gives it a certain energy you can see the background has changed completely because um, I started off with the idea of doing the perspective and then I changed my mind and decided that I wanted uh, a very simple graphic uh, background which I think works much better it's um, um, it's got a bit more depth to it and it doesn't interfere with where I want the viewer to look in this case so at this point um, I'll present this to the art director or the production designer and he might say that's great or not or change this or whatever but uh, if this was going to be a film asset or a game asset he might say well what does it look like from behind um, what are the engines like what does it look like from the top and I could do many drawings but the simplest way for me to do it is to build it in 3D and as the point of this is to use this to do an oil painting I can use the 3D to nail the perspective and get that absolutely accurately. So this is my 3D application of choice, which is Modo. Um, I've got the Photoshop drawing in there, that's in the camera view. And I normally start off by dropping a figure into this because I know the figure is uh, two meters high in the Modo universe. So everything else that I might build now will be uh, to that scale means that I can just eyeball it. I don't have to do any measuring or anything. It's worth building stuff to scale in Modo in particular because the lights are physically based. So when you apply the lights to them, um, the fall off will behave as if it was looking at a 10 foot object or a 50 foot object or whatever. So everything I do starts as a box in 3D. So I'm building a box which more or less corresponds to the size of uh, the spaceship. You can see the um, camera window there. I'm moving the box. So it's lying over the ship, but I'm not moving the geometry. The geometry stays in the middle of the Modo universe because that's the easiest place to do the modeling. Um, I'm moving the little guy out of the way there and dropping him where he would be standing on the platform underneath. Uh, I've got three monitors here. So that camera view is uh, accessible to me all the time. Um, so I can keep referring to it as a I'm modeling this and just kind of making it up as I go along. So I don't, if you don't know much about 3D, there are three different ways you can manipulate the geometry basically the, the points which are positioned in 3d space if you join two points together you get an edge and if you join three or more points together you get a polygon uh, which is the flat surface and generally four uh, pointed uh, polys called known as quads uh, work best with some of the tools so sometimes um, it's best to have those so uh, what I was doing there was copying and pasting the polygons from the top of the box and dropping them over the top to make the different layers. That's the camera view I've just dragged in um, so you can see it. But as I say, I have access to it all the time. And I'm basically lining up the geometry so it fits um, the 3D drawing as close as I can get it. Um, there's always a compromise when you go from 2D to 3D. And so you have to sometimes have to make some decisions about whether what you're doing in 3D is better or whether you try and emulate what you did um, in the 2D drawing. Meadow's got a nice tool that allows you to apply fall off to things. So you can taper geometry um, to uh, and make it more accessible at one end. So there I'm using it to taper the, the back of the fuselage and the same with the, these edges. 
um, the ball off drops towards the top. So I'm just using the move tool and that um, drags that edge at the bottom more than at the top. So you end up um, with the whole thing kind of um, a slope. So what I'm doing now is creating what's called a cookie cutter, which is basic to perform a Boolean function, which basically means uh, is a fancy way of saying you use one shape to cut another shape out. Um, again, referring to the um, drawing on one of the other monitors, I'm just trying to uh, emulate the shape that I drew that I know I'm going to have to cut out. It'll uh, become clear in a moment if this is uh, new to you. Um, so I'm doing this in a separate layer. It's called a mesh item in Modo. If you look on the right hand side there, you can see all the mesh items. But basically, it's just like a layer in Photoshop. So just manipulating that edge. So I'm getting the shape roughly right. Um, it's also, it's useful in great in 3D to be turning the thing around all the time. So I've cut and pasted that and dropped it into the geometry that I want to cut. I can't actually remember what the keyboard shortcut is, so I have to go and search through the menu um, to remind myself what it is. Uh, and then I apply the Boolean cut, and you can see there that it's cut that shape out uh, on both sides because it went all the way through. Yeah, I was saying it's I do find it quite exciting at this point because you've had a, a 2D drawing and working traditionally for many years, um, you never saw your paintings like this, um, but suddenly it's become a real thing that you can turn around and look at from every kind of angle. So I'm not too bothered about the geometry for this because it's never going to be animated, but there's certain tools that work better with quads than they do with triangles or five-pointed polygons. So uh, I'm just going to uh, quickly fix the geometry on this so that I can run some different tools on it, like that slice tool, which wouldn't work if there were more than if there weren't four-pointed polygons. But basically what I want to do is cut a, a groove in this. So I'm just creating those edges um, and a string of polygons, which I can select um, and then delete. And that gives me the, uh, the shape that I want there. Um, so now I've just got to select that middle edge and drop it into the center of the Modo universe on the uh, X axis so that when I mirror it, the two edges will line up perfectly like that. Obviously I've hidden all the other geometry at the moment to switch those layers off. Um, so that I can just work on this piece of geometry and get it as I want it. So that brought all that back. So now it's just a question of um, moving around the geometry uh, and trying to match up um, the drawing that I did, basically eyeballing it. If this was going to be an actual asset for a film, um, I probably wouldn't do it. The modelers would do it um, because this is basically a, a design iteration. Um, I'd, I would be more concerned about how the geometry flowed, but uh, it doesn't really matter for these purposes as long as it renders out well enough for me to use it as a reference. I'm just fixing the geometry on that and then I couldn't paste it the same polys from beneath and then deleting those polys and just extending those edges whizzing around a bit because it's speeded up. This probably, again, took me four or five hours to do from beginning to end, something like that. So, yeah, just select edges and extend them. Just basically use what's there and just manipulate it until the shape is the, the way I want it to be. So I selected that point in there and beveled it so I've got a round edge. So now I'm uh, creating um, that little hatchway now, I've got symmetry switched on, so it's happening on both sides. Uh, but symmetry is a bit odd sometimes with um, with Modo. It doesn't always work, so sometimes it's easier to split it in two and mirror it. So now what I'm doing is creating another cookie cutter to uh, cut out a Boolean shape in all that geometry at the end um, to create that peculiar shape that I drew. Um, so uh, just creating the shape in, in another layer. And I tried to run the slice tool there, but you can see it didn't work because that's a five-pointed poly, five polygon on the side. So I'm using a different tool. I'm just using the slice tool. So there, there are different ways of doing it um, if one way doesn't work. Sometimes you get rendering errors as well with um, five-pointed polys and that. But again, it's not something that I need to worry about too much. So just... Uh, making sure this is about right. 
and then cut and paste it into that piece of geometry, run the Boolean cut, and it's made that shape. And then cut and paste that one as well, and cut and paste it into the final bit. And so now I've got that shape that um, I drew, more or less. Again, turning it around all the time, looking at it from different angles. Um, I might come back to this at some point. I might use this geometry again for a different job. Um, so I'll probably do more work than is necessary. So I'm just kind of modeling the uh, bits on the side. Everything generally starts with a primitive, um, which you then modify. So that's a cylinder, you taper the front end, split it. Same with this, it's just a globe that's flattened. And then you delete the polygons that you don't want. Um, same with that. And select those edges to create those peculiar fins that um, I've got and then using the, um, the fall off tool to taper it towards the end. If you look at it from the top in a moment, you can see how that's working. And then just kind of moving the geometry around. So this, the, it's, as I was saying about doing a compromise from the 2D to the, the 3D, um, the way I drew this was it probably down to just being badly drawn, but it didn't quite fit that shape exactly. So I'm trying to emulate what I drew, um, whether it was really necessary or not. It probably gives it a little bit more interest. So having created that shape, I then run the Thicken tool on it, and that makes it a solid 3D object. So just moving the geometry around. So I thought I'd add, um, well, and just add in some uh, these edges, um, kind of uh, fins or whatever they are at the bottom of the ship. So this is Modo's interactive renderer. So everything I do, now it gets rendered in real time, which is really useful. Um, there's no texture or anything applied to this. It's just a basic um, shiny gray that uh, is the default surface and Modo applies to everything until you apply something different to it. Um, but it's much easier now um, for me to try and line it up with the drawing. And here I'm trying to make the shape match up to what I drew, um, but it, I wasn't, just wasn't gonna get that right. So um, in the end, I felt that was probably close enough. And it, did it really matter that much? So, yeah, I thought I'd add an engine bay. I mean, you're not going to see this for this particular project, but it's something I might do. As I was saying, if the production designer, the art director, wanted to know what the rear end of the ship looked like. Uh, and again, I might come back to this and use it for something else. Um, and it's just fun to do. I just spent too much time, really, um, doing this kind of thing. Uh, see, the geometry is not quite right there, so I've just got to move that um, that vertice down so the, the bevel works properly. Uh, before I used 3D, I used to build physical models made up out of uh, scratch built from model kits and various shampoo bottles and things like that, uh, and then photograph them. Um, and again, with those, I spent far too much time building the models because I just enjoyed doing it. Um, I didn't really need to go to the lengths that I went to. Um, then when I finally made the move to digital, I found that um, working this way wasn't that far removed from the way I used to do it uh, before 3D. I, I used to have a drawer full of model kits, model bits um, that I would recycle uh, and use for different spaceships or whatever. And it's very much the same in 3D. Um, I've got a catalogue uh, collection of um, 3D models um, that you can just kind of... Uh, pile together and take one bit from one thing and jam it into another and uh, you know, custom build a, a different spaceship from existing parts. So it's very similar to the way I used to work before. That's probably why I took to it so well. So here I'm creating those spikes, which was kind of the, um, the start of the, what started the whole design off. And just build one spike and then just duplicate it and move it around so it's uh, in position. And just uh, brought the interactive renderer in again. So, and again, it's just easier to to see um, with that uh, render, whether it's lining up or whether it's not. So they aren't in quite the same correct place. So I'll select a centre point for them and just rotate them around until they're lining up with the drawing. It's interesting that 
uh, possibly some of the that was the lent to the spikes um, were because I wasn't thinking about it carefully enough when I was um, drawing it. Um, but actually, that asymmetric or different shapes and sizes um, are, are quite interesting. So I'm starting to build the um, platform, the, the the docking platform that the ship's going to move into. So I create a couple of discs, duplicate them, spin them around. You can see immediately the perspective's not right because in my drawing it was much more like a long lens, but that's too much too much of a wide angle look um, to match the drawing. So I create a, another camera and give it a greater focal length, moved it to 109 millimeter, I think it was. Um, although I just did it by eye, that's how it ended up. And that looks much more like um, my drawing. So this is the view through the light. And as you can see, as I'm rotating the light, you look on the, the render on the right hand side, you can see that uh, the light and shade is moving and I'm trying to create that idea of um, the backlight um, that I, I was going with from the start. I'm just creating some very simple materials here. Um, it basically just going to be orange. I, again, you could um, finish this entire image in Modo and finish up with a very photographic looking um, images. I could have done with the, the Photoshop drawing as well. And that's applying that material there. You can see that the render immediately draws it and fills it in. I started off creating a, a few different materials, but in the end, I just did it all orange because that's what I really needed to do um, for these purposes. So that's a finished model. Um, it's orange. Um, I've got the little ship in and the tether. I even went to the trouble of giving the characters um, some color uh, and some hair and stuff. But um, and that's the uh, the final render with the drawing. Uh, and then without the drawing, with the Modo sky. Um, and the nice thing about this is that Modo is calculating how that sky and those colors would reflect in the material, which gives me a nice reference to work to. Um, so Modo does uh, a variety of um, render outputs. This one's called Surface. I think when I say Modo, it does all three software works this way now. Um, the point of this is to be able to select different parts of the render in Photoshop so you can work on them easily. Um, but because I'm going to take this into um, an oil painting, uh, there is another use uh, for these surface, um, for these different renders that I'll show you in the next section. Okay, Keith. So the final oil painting, um, that's a Modo render. Uh, and behind it is the, we're back in Photoshop now, of course. That's the final render. Behind it is the um, Photoshop drawing that I did. And these are the render outputs. So if I just see the different layers, if I drag that to the top, so if you, in Photoshop, run the Find Edges filter on this, what it does is create quite a nice line drawing. It's multicolored at the moment. If I desaturate it, you end up with something that's like a, quite a nice pencil drawing. Um, it's got some bits missing, but to fix that, there's another render output, which is the surface normal render output. Again, run that the edge filter, and you end up with something that looks a bit like a nice pencil drawing, uh, but it's missing bits. But if I make the top, uh, one multiply and combine the two, you end up with a pretty good, useful line drawing that I can use to transfer this image onto a canvas or a piece of illustration board, and whatever it is I'm going to paint it onto. So I need to get that into the Photoshop um, image. So I'll create a folder for those two layers um, and then drag it from the Modo render into the Photoshop render. If you press shift when you're doing that in Photoshop, it drops it in exactly the same place if the, um, if the image sizes are the same. So if I make that uh, into a multiply, you can see the line drawing overlaid on my Photoshop drawing and it lines up pretty, pretty accurately um, as you would expect it to do. I've got to do the background at this point. So I create a layer, fill it with white and that hides everything in the background and then um, drop the opacity down to about 50% so I can see the background. It looks a bit blown out at the minute because I've got a levels layer there, which um, I've forgotten about. So I'll switch that off in a minute and it'll work better. And remember, there you go, switch that off. So now you can see the, the background, um, but it's not so strong that it's going to obliterate what I do. So I'll create another layer and then start drawing uh, the background. So the background is very simple. It wants to be graphic. 
I could have modeled this in Modo as well, but I would have ended up with all sorts of perspective um, problems because this is an object that would have to be miles high and a long way away with, with, or with a very long lens. Um, so it, it really wasn't worth the effort of uh, doing that. So uh, I'm just going to draw the shapes in. Um, if you shift click with the brush in Photoshop, it will join the two clicks together and draw you a straight line. And so that's how I'm, I'm putting these straight lines in and putting the tethers in there. I quite like um, that kind of odd thing about the tethers because the tethers are obviously been affected by gravity and being pulled down into that arc. Um, but this massive metal thing is floating. So the, the two things next to each other create quite a kind of nice paradox. And so I'm just using the eraser tool there to take out the um, lines that I don't want. Uh, I need a bit more detail to the platform there. So I did notice that those two lines were causing a nasty tangent where they touched the spike. So I just selected those and moved them across. Um, and I also noted that that platform wasn't sticking out as much as it was in the original drawing, which um, I think probably works better. So I'm just extending that out there. So here we are in the real world. And I've printed that out on some inkjet paper and I've drawn on the back of it. Uh, and I'm going to paint this on a piece of hardboard that's been primed with gesso primer. Um, and I'm using the end of a brush to transfer the pencil lines. It's a bit too, if this was a translucent surface like a canvas or paper, I would just put it on a light box uh, and just draw it that way. Um, but uh, I quite like the way the paint slips about um, on the hard gesso surface. So it's quite, it is quite a rough set. I've put the gesso on with a brush. So there are brush marks in there, which give it a bit of teeth, tooth so it's not completely smooth. I try um, not to use, uh, although there's a straight edge and an ellipse guide there, I try not to uh, use those when I'm drawing um, because the lines start becoming too mechanical. So then I've transferred it. Uh, it's darker in places because I used a softer brush. So at this point, what I like to do is just, do a bit of shading with pencil um, and essentially produce a drawing. There's a couple of reasons for this. Um, when I start to paint, I'm not presented with a mass of lines that don't really mean anything, you know, or it's hard to judge what they mean. Um, so when I, when I look at it, it's, it's there. I can see where I'm going. It's like an underpainting for an underpainting, I suppose. Um, I also just quite like doing it. Uh, and um, it, it, I think when you're doing something like this, when you're painting, anything that you can do to put you in a good um, mental state, a mental frame of mind, um, helps you doing the painting. I know various artists who have particular things that they always do. There's one artist I know who will do a couple of lines on a canvas and then discard the canvas. She has to do that every time. Uh, and then just start on the actual canvas. And it's just her way, really, of getting the mind in the right place um, for doing, for working on it. Um, so I quite like it's a bit zen like as well doing these drawings it's just quite pleasant to do I say again I'm trying I don't well, I try I don't use a ruler um, to do any of the straight lines I just try and draw them in freehand so it's not too mechanical so that's the final drawing done so it's ready to put on the easel and begin painting so here it is on the easel I've got the photoshop uh, draw in there and then the modo render above um, to refer to so finally we can start to apply paint i always start um, putting the darkest tones in first because um, it helps me judge what the other tones should be so this it's essentially black that i'm putting in although black for me is a mixture of ultramarine and burnt sienna uh, it's just a more lively color than black out of the tube would be uh, and if I want it to be cooler, I can add more blue. If I want it to be warmer, I can add more burnt sienna. So again, at this stage, I'm just trying to, I don't use any kind of aids um, to draw the lines. I'm just trying to put them in. One of the things that I'm trying to do is paint in a, a looser style. And I painted all the detail out in that because it was pointless leaving it in. So I don't know why I did that in the first place. Um, I'm trying to paint in a looser style, but decades of painting every single nut and bolt and rivet um, it's made it kind of hard for me to be able to do that. So it's kind of varying uh, success in trying to loosen up a bit. So 
uh, when you're starting to put this black in as well, it's um, it begins to take form and uh, starts to make sense. So I always start with the sky, I always start with the background and work forward. So um, using a, a big flat chisel brush, starting putting the sky, which is basically just ultramarine and white in this case. I quite like the chisel brushes, especially for a mechanical subject like this, um, because it obviously it's easy to paint up to the edges of things. This whole thing probably took me about a day to, to put the basic um, colour down. Working on the smooth surface um, tends to mean I probably have to apply a couple of layers to get the paint um, as I want it. So I'm just putting yellow in there with a, using a different brush um, to try to keep the yellow clean. Although I did find that um, it was a bit too clean. So I had to go and contaminate uh, the ultramarine with the yellow and the, uh, the yellow with the blue to make the whole thing a bit more homogenous. As you can see, I'm going over that top bit um, to just get the, br the brush marks um, more the way I want them to be. So there's quite a bit of paint going on there. It's pretty thick. Um, I think that's quite nice. I quite like, uh, you know, the action of putting thick buttery paint on, onto a surface. So you can start on the foreground, obviously making it a bit warmer and a bit bluer. Let me go into the shadow areas. So as I painted this, I was beginning to um, think about the uh, the lighting and um, it occurred to me that maybe the backlighting that I decided to do wasn't the most interesting uh, way of doing it, that if the light was more on the front, it would emphasise the fact that the front of the ship was in shadow uh, and those interesting um, panels on the side would cast more interesting shadows. Um, but at this point, I'm just putting it in as I imagined uh, it needed to be. Next, I want to put the ship in. Um, I think I started off with the idea that it would be uh, a big rusty kind of, uh, almost a derelict hulk um, that's been around for quite a bit. So it's weathered and battered. So the, the blacks here, um, the blacks won't end up as black as that. I'll paint into those and make them lighter. Uh, but it just gives me, um, as I say, a, a good way to judge what the other tone should be. So obviously making the, uh, the highlights warmer where the sun's catching the top of the ship and making the shadow areas more blue. a bit of attention to uh, where the highlights would be. And the top of the ship's catching a bit of blue light from the sky. So make sure to put that in. So I got the mile stick out at this point because um, I felt that I just needed a, a bit of help um, to get the, uh, the edges um, and the, um, the detail incorrectly. So having gone to a lot of trouble to get the perspective right, um, I'm going to uh, make the most of it really at this point. Fred, Brian, yeah. Mart Brian Martelli here is asking, are you thinning the paint or is it straight out of the tube? Uh, no, I'm mixing the paint. I, I, I re rarely uh, use paint straight out of the tube. Um, this is yellow ochre. Uh, uh, ultramarine, white, uh, and um, uh, I think he meant like, did you add mediums or anything to thin the paint? Oh, mediums, sorry. No, um, I've tried using mediums, but um, it just makes, well, I don't know. It affects the uh, the paints. It's easier to just use water, really. These, are, by the way, are water-soluble oils, um, which uh, I just think are fantastic. Um, 
So talking about the light, I decided that you know, I was talking about the, the light not being quite right before. So I went back into Modo. Um, this is looking through the, um, the light again. You can see it, I'm just moving it round. Um, and you can see the light is now shining on the front. And I thought, well, that's a lot more interesting than what I was doing, which is basically you know, a flat shape, with just a, a line of light at the top. And, it, and again, it emphasizes the fact that the ship's uh, in shadow. There's another question here for you. They're wondering yeah. if you often require to deliver an oil painting or just a digital version of it. Um, I, I wouldn't do an oil painting for a commercial job these days. Uh, the oil painters I do are mainly just for my own amusement. Um, I have, I was commissioned to do an oil painting uh, earlier in the year. Um, obviously, you wanted the oil painting. If somebody, uh, if there was a commercial job where they specifically wanted me to do it as an oil painting, then um, I would scan it and uh, work on it in Photoshop and send them a digital file if it was for uh, a commercial job. Um, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> it's just too, so many changes are required, particularly for concept art, that it's just so much easier to do it digitally. So I thought I'd put a bit of smoke in um, here to uh, give it a bit of atmosphere and highlight the ship. And um, in the end, I felt that was doing too good a job. I have, I'm having problems with the composition at this point, And I found that my eye kept drifting to that little ship and putting the smoke and the highlight there wasn't helping. It was pulling the eye away, especially when I added the tether to it. And my eye can just kind of travel down the tether to the little ship. So you'll see shortly that um, I made a big change to it at the very end. Yeah, I've tried various mediums, but um, it just you know it just overcomplicates everything. So this is the final thing, uh, and as you can see, it's, there's been a lot more work added. I've added some little guys doing a bit of repair work and some platforms, graphics, um, trying to keep it loose. I could have tightened it all up, but I'm kind of trying to keep it loose. Uh, so you can see the biggest change here is I've uh, got rid of the little ship because. <laughs> It just, um, it was bothering me and the the, uh, the tether going to it was kind of taking my eye out to the right. And I just felt it needed to have some kind of balance, a stronger balance to the platform on the left. So um, in the end, I just painted it out. Uh, and I think that's worked better now because you look where you need to go. You want to just move it on then, Keith, we were almost at the end. Uh, I just put the brushes in there. So um, it gives you an idea of the scale. Without, if you can see it behind me, the painting on the easel behind me. Um, and this is a detail of uh, that platform, which I put in very quickly right at the end. And it's probably my favorite part of the painting, funnily enough. So that's it. I hope um, you enjoyed that and got something out of it. As I say, it was it's not a definitive way or even a sensible way to do anything. You, you could do the entire image in Photoshop or in 3D, um, but it's just an interesting way that the that you can combine all these different working methods if you want to. Thank you so much. That is so insightful. I know it's quite troublesome to cut this video together because it is a really long workflow, right? So say in real life, how long did this whole thing take you? Well, as I say, it took me about four or five hours to do the Photoshop rough and you say a day then for each, for each session. It took me about a, a day to block the painting in. And then I probably spent another couple of days fiddling with it. And of course, because I decided to change it, that uh, spent, took more time than it should have really have taken. Yeah, and that is how much work Fred put in for this presentation. So I want to give you guys a perspective of the actual process, even though we only show you the condensed 45 minutes of the highlight reels, but it is quite lengthy, but um, you can kind of see his thought process and I enjoy him explaining the thought process really well. And as I mentioned earlier in the chat, the purpose of this is for you to understand a general workflow that can be applied to anything you do, right? Like That's this right. is not limited to just a spaceship scene. So no, yeah, anyway. Yeah, so um, earlier there's a question um, about why Photoshop, why not Procreate? Right. Oh, well. I've been doing this for a few years, as you can see. <laughs> so I just started off with Photoshop uh, and I know Photoshop. I, I've looked at Procreate. I think with Procreate, I would have actually bought a new iPad and uh, an Apple pen 
and I couldn't really see. I mean, I've seen fantastic things done with it, and I do like uh, the results I see. But um, for my purposes, I understand the no Photoshop, so that's why I've stuck with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of that is your personal preference, right? Like nothing against one software or the other, and every software has mm -hmm. its own um, unique features, kind of like oil paintings, you, you prefer certain brushes for certain reasons because they, they get the job done the way you want to get it done for your own personality, your style. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think we can kind of tie that into a quick conversation about defining your style or finding your voice. A lot of that is through experimentation, right? You experiment with different tools, different digital or traditional tools on mediums even or subjects or, you know, like different surfaces until you find something that just works for you, right? Absolutely. And that, that's what, the way I see it is just like the way we talk, the way we eat, the way we walk, there's a certain way that just works for you. And yeah. well, also, I think yeah. you, just, you just get used to um, the way certain things work. So going back to traditional in particular, um, back when I used to airbrush, I would only work on one kind of illustration board and I would only use one kind of paint and I would only use one kind of airbrush because I knew if I did something, I knew what the results would be. So there was no kind of second guessing because as an illustrator, you're working to a deadline generally. Um, it's not like being an artist, you just follow your muse for the day and think, well, I'll just try something else. And, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. If, if you're working to a deadline, then you've got to know what the results are going to be. Um, and it's the same with the set, the painting surface. I quite like that hardboard just had surface, as I say. I know what's going to happen when I apply the paint. Uh, recently, I've been going out and doing a bit of plain air painting in oils, and I've been trying different surfaces, and I'm really struggling because it's an alien environment. It's an alien surface. It's I'm just not used to it. So when I apply the paint, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. <laughs> so the whole thing can uh, get a bit frustrating. But, yeah, it's just a question of doing it, really. When I started with the 3D stuff, it was right at the beginning of the digital revolution. There really was only Photoshop, uh, and it was very clunky and slow. There were very few 3D programs that would run on desktop machines. You know, now it's Blender's free. Blender's just an amazing bit of 3D software, um, and it's free. But back then, it was hugely expensive. So you would devote a lot of time to learning that bit of software and uh, invest a lot of money in it as well. And so consequently, you tended to stay with it. Yeah, and I like how you said um, you were, well, for your work, you were meeting a lot of deadlines. And when it comes to deadlines, consistency is the key. Because if right. you don't have consistency, you're going to miss the deadlines. Because you, yeah. you can work really hard and then you don't know if you're going to make this work or not because you don't have the consistency. So a lot of these repeat themes or throughout the three days, we talk about basically the same thing, right? You know, shapes, value, edges, yeah. color all those things but the more you practice or the more you get to know your tools whether it's um airbrush digital tool traditional tool brushes oils get to know them until you find something that you know this stroke is going to look the same as the next one and the next one and the next one the way you lay it down it's going to be consistent yeah. from the material side from the software hardware side also on your side it's the artist your technique is sharp enough enough that you know when you do this shape it's going to look exactly the same for the thousand shapes that you do you know what it's going to do i mean when i when i first started um before all the digital stuff um working for doing book covers mainly um, i started off working in oils uh, and i had huge problems with the drying times of course and i would sometimes um quite often stick the painting behind a radiator overnight so it would dry uh, but um, and it would bend, you know, the, the illustration board would go into a kind of banana shape because of the heat on it. Yeah. Uh, and so I'd kind of straighten it up and send it off. And it, uh, more more than once, I've had art directors ring me and say the overlay stuck to it because although it felt dry to the touch, it wasn't actually dry. And on the journey down to London, um, the overlay stuck into the still kind of slightly tacky paint. So that's why I moved from oils to acrylics. Uh, the water-based paints and started using an airbrush because it was just a faster way of doing it. Yeah, and that's kind of the key, right? You, 
is you go through different things and sometimes the deadlines could change. Um, you may come across some obstacles like this and you just have to kind of work through it. The more experienced you are, the more okay. willing you, try, you are to try new things will help you out. Um, Brian Martelli told me sometimes similar problem here, you know, for the oil to dry enough to get the next layer. Um, sometimes you'll put his paintings in the car in the summer. So right. in the car, it gets hot and you kind of dry it to touch just enough for you to continue to work. Um, mm -hmm. I did hear an artist, local artist um, hosting a workshop and they're trying to dry the oils for <laughs> the next day. And the artist actually tried to put it in the oven right. to, to dry it, even though it's low heat, but somehow it destroyed it. So do not try to put it in the oven. That, that's no, been, that's probably been, not a bad idea. Failed. <laughs> And the other like thing it. is that all these drying techniques are fine uh, in the short term if they work, uh, but in the long term, they're probably going to destroy the paint, you know, so like in 10 years or so, you find the paint's discolored. Or, uh -huh. And you can get yeah. dry mediums for oils as well, but uh, particularly for traditional oils, they're a bit lethal, a bit dangerous, the chemicals. So that's why I like the water-based oils so much. Yeah, so um, we have about a few minutes. So do you want to give us some parting tips um, for us, for people who have the courage to try to explore and get out of their comfort zone. Is there any word of advice? And we can just kind of segue from there. And thank yeah. you everybody for joining us. And thank you, Fred, today. Yeah, thank, thank you for everybody for coming. I really appreciate you coming to listen to me. Um, I don't really know what to say about that other than you've just got to follow your muse, basically just do what you're interested uh, in doing um, and just experiment. You know, there's no, there really is no shortcut. Um, it's just a question of um, doing it and doing it, you know, putting those hours in. Um, yeah, I think it's, was it 10,000 hours or something is the tipping point before you can get competent at doing anything, I do believe. So get your 10,000 hours in is the, the basic tip. <laughs>